not even connected. They're they're just they're working on their phones during text messages. Yeah, there's an odd irony there too, to some degree. I'm not and I'm not against this technology. There's a value to it. Once again, if you use it well. But um, it can be a poor substitute for relationships. I am aware of people who are very gifted and uh, gifted is not the term. There's no real gift in it. Uh, who are very, very um, pro proficient in text messaging. Who are who are who are not proficient in relationships. They are uncomfortable in a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody. But they're fine on fine texting. The odd deal is someone's right, right, right in the same room and they're texting. That's really pr pretty bizarre. Where there, maybe there's a thing that used to be called face-to-face -face conversation because it involved a few things that text messaging and emails do not involve. For example, nonverbal uh, cues, nonverbal communication, or um, tone of voice. Most of the message is really, I fear, lost in that. And the relational time of just being together with no big agenda is another thing. When do we meet with people just to enjoy the time rather than to have an agenda? Uh, when's the last time someone called you just to see how you were doing with no hidden agenda? Um, you know, it's, it, that can be a refreshing change. Maybe you ought to try that sometime. Just surprise somebody by telling them, I just wanted to tell you I was thinking about you. And that uh, I really am grateful for our relationship. Something that simple can be a very disproportionately meaningful thing. Yes? On almost okay. every book on uh, body language, you know, about how you read people, and there's books of how they can actually go into prisons and read prisoners. They can tell when they're, they're guilty just by the way they sit in the chair if you read any of those books. 85% of the communication between people is body language. doesn't have anything to do with what you say as much as uh, the way you say it. Well, certainly nonverbal cues are just huge. It's a whole v vocabulary. is a whole language of that, whether it's with the eyes, the hands, or any other kind of a thing. I, I think so. Doug. Doug uh, oh, there you are. This whole uh, idea of each day has trouble, as long as I recall, was referenced to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. He talked about worry. And don't worry because the birds of the field and the living is the birds. Yes. It's in Matthew, I think it's like. This time, this time, at least the economic time, touch on worry a little bit. Yeah. Um, I had a conversation with someone just the other day about this issue of worry, and again, how worry is. There are two things about worry. A, it's unbiblical because it supposes that God's out of control and I don't know what, he doesn't know what, what's going on. And B, it's unproductive. It's unproductive because much of what we worry about won't happen anyway. And if it does happen, your worry didn't make it better. You see, and your worry will not change the thing. Who by being anxious can add one cubit to his stature, as Jesus put it, by being anxious? Anxiety isn't something that's going to help you. The better course then is to move in an iterative manner, in the direction that you know you're called to move. I remember, for example, times when I was paralyzed because of the overwhelming burden of what I saw before me. Um, uh, I did this twice uh, with a, a, a PhD dissertation, and uh, I let the thing go and go and go and realized it was either fish or cut bait. I got to finish this thing up or not. But I'm working full time, and how to get back into that mode is no easy thing. And I remember at one point I was just o utterly overwhelmed. It was the uh, Oxford D. Phil thesis, and um, I was in, living in Marietta at the time, and I realized it's either now or never. But the thing was just such a burden because after coming back, I'd gotten immersed in my activities. And to go back into that academic mode, the, the research mode, is not an easy task. So how on earth where am I going to make this shift? It was so, such a big burden. And the answer came very, very clearly. The answer was one little bite at a time. That's the answer. So what I did is I started getting up an hour earlier. I got up an hour earlier in the morning. And I used that extra hour in the morning, which meant, of course, I had to go to bed an hour earlier. So usually I, I, what I was doing is really trading a mediocre hour for a better hour. That's what, really what I'm doing here is a trade-off here. Usually the, the, last night, the, the last hours are not that productive. If you really think about it, we kind of veg out and get in this uh, strange comatose state. We won't tell Karen you said that. <laughs> we won't tell Karen you said that. <laughs> Uh, smart guy, huh? <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I, what I did was this. I said, I'm just going to get up an hour earlier, and I'm going to start my work, and I'm not going to worry about how much I get done. That was another important decision. I don't have to write X number of pages. I'm just going to, if, if I just stare at the screen or stare at the books, so let it be. But eventually, you'll train yourself that that's what you do during this hour. And after a while, ever so slowly, I found that I began to do a little bit at a time. Some days were very productive, some days were less, but showing up is what I discovered what it, what it was all about. And so it was. And so bit by bit, it began to accumulate a kind of momentum. And I th suggest that that's a similar strategy that we could all embrace, whereby we build the momentum by fidelity to the small things, showing up. And it's, it's really the spirituality of small, small steps. It's not the big thing. Uh, you never achieve the big thing. It's always one little thing at a time. It's the little things that really uh, add up and matter. So for me, then, the worry would have been unproductive. And I was actually being paralyzed by that fear, by that worry, by that anxiety. This is a way of, uh, of moving from fear to faith. And that's what this whole session, these teachings are about in this series, is moving from fear to faith. That's really what I'm seeking to do. I think there was a question back there. Can you see? Yes. You know, a lot of worry and uh, angst comes from wounds in your own heart. And uh, five times, the places where Jesus can place his hand in your wounds, mm -hmm. I think those are the moments that, uh, that uh, even during your day, that allow you to be more mm -hmm. to overcome with his hand in your Yeah. You're making a space. You're slowing down. And... Uh, I think that's a time when, as you say, during those quiet times, that he's able to speak to you in a, in a deeper and more profound way. When you stop fighting and start listening, I think can be a very important shift to make. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Any other thoughts? Yes. I think okay. I've always uh, taken comfort from Isaiah 53, where Isaiah writes that uh, Messiah bears not only our sins, but our sorrows. Hmm. Uh, the comment back there that, uh, you know, uh, the things that have happened to me that uh, uh, leave wounds, I can actually take those to him. He's already borne them and will bear them. Mm -hmm. I don't quite understand it. Mm -hmm. But the idea of him bearing your sorrows and, your, and the grief, yeah. So that we don't, we don't serve an, uh, an indifferent or distant uh, father, but one who is uh, intimately acquainted. And the imagery there in Hebrews 2 and 4, which we've looked at before, the imagery of a f merciful and faithful high priest who knows what it's like to be tempted, who understands, because of his solidarity with the human condition, what it is to go through all the things that we go through, yet without sin is one then that can identify, empathize with our condition. But we've got to stop fighting and do a little listening. And that sometimes requires then to, to, um, to surrender to love rather than fighting against his, his love. We often think with kids, if you look at the analogy with children, you know that there are times when your child, you're trying to do something better for them, and yet they're trying to fight the very good that you're trying to give them. And we all can see by analogy how that easily can be uh, a part of our life with, uh, with God as well. I think as I see in Scripture, uh, there is a uh, fantastic diversity of overcomings in Scripture throughout the history of God's people um, that people in their unique stories, and each of us has a unique life story, has a role to play and this role can be critical and it certainly can be unique, or that our actions and attitudes really do matter to God. And really, I think our perspective of what is important and unimportant can be the critical thing about us. It's often out of balance. Um, I imagine the day when we stand before Christ, um, we will not know in this life what will turn out to be the most important opportunity we've had. You won't know this day. You can't anticipate this day what the most important moment will be in this day. You cannot be, know that. But God knows what that will be, and we need to be open enough and alive enough so that we can have the margin to uh, sense when that occurs. If, uh, if we are able to then uh, move in that direction and 